Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. What we're looking at is Pentecost. Pentecost has, has arrived. Beginning at verse 1, Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, let me give to you a review, but as we do so, I'll, I'll begin by saying this. Um, my pastor, Chuck Smith, was my pastor for many years and was a tremendous influence in my personal life and in his heart and his love for God's Word and all uh, became a real um, encouragement to me as a young man, as a young pastor, and has remained with me through the entire course of my ministry life. And uh, there were two things that Pastor Chuck tried to pour into to us as pastors. When he would speak at, at pastor's conferences and all, uh, he would share these things. And, and in the last several years of, of his life, I was on a council, uh, one of the council members of those who planned out the uh, International Calvary Chapel Pastors Conferences and all. And I had opportunity to be with him for, we'd be together for three days and he would pour into various pastors from around the nation and, and, and would share with us things concerning his heart and what he desired to see happen at the upcoming pastors' conferences that we would be planning. And, and he always started out this way, you know, and I've shared this with you more than once, but my mind goes to it when I think of this subject. We would be in a room and there'd be about 20 to 30 pastors from, from the East Coast to the West Coast and everything in between. And each one of these men would represent a region, represent a, an area of ministry, and each one had seasoned ministry and all, and, and we would gather together. And uh, as we would, we'd be speaking amongst ourselves because some of the guys have known each other over 40 years, and I've known many of the men on that council for 30-some years. And so we've known each other for a long time and a long time of ministry together. And so the guys would be talking amongst ourselves, and Chuck would walk in the room and he'd always go to the same place and he'd, he'd be seated and all the guys, and it didn't matter if we were 50 or 60 years old, we all did the same thing. We all got quiet the minute he walked in the room and he would go and he'd sit down. And this is the question that was asked every time. Somebody would say, Pastor Chuck, what is on your heart? And Chuck would look at us and then he'd, they'd say, what is it you're concerned about? Because we wanted to know. He always said the same thing. As long as I can remember, he would say, have we begun in the spirit? And are we going to be made perfect by the flesh? He always went to the same thing. Having begun in the spirit, we need to continue walking in the spirit. There were two things that Chuck taught us that I think are so biblical that it's part of who I am. He taught us a love for the word of God and he taught us to walk in the power of the Spirit. And today in the church, I believe there's an absence of both. There's an absence of a love for God's Word. What do I mean by that? I mean that if it contradicts the way we already think, we reject it. We just reject it. We just say, no, that can't be so. I don't agree with that. There is a, a flippant attitude towards God's Word today. You know, the Bible says in the last days, People will heap unto themselves teachers who will tell them what they're itching to hear. And we're living in those days right now, and so there's a, an absence for a real respect and reverence for the Word of God and a willingness to obey. And there's a quenching of the Holy Spirit because there are so many man-made techniques trying to get people to come into the church that they're failing to realize that what you really need is a solid study of the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit because that's what we all need on a daily basis if we're going to make it. If we're going to make it not just as Christians, of course as Christians, but if we're just going to make it, we need the power of the Spirit, and we need a love for God's Word. Why? Because God's Word is what conforms, transforms us in order that we're not conformed to the world, and it transforms us and conforms us into the image of Jesus Christ. You see, it's the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the Lord Jesus Christ made a promise. He had said, 
that this was to take place. And remember, even in chapter 1, verse 4, he had commanded his, his disciples to do something. He said, you need to wait for the promise of the Father. So all the way back in chapter 1, verse 4 of the book of Acts, he had said, wait for the promise of the Father. Now, when he said wait, wait for the promise, that word wait is an interesting Greek word. It means to await an event, literally, which in this case was the, the waiting for the Holy Spirit to be given. When he says you're going to be waiting, you're also to wait for a promise. The word promise means an announcement of divine assurance for good. And I was looking this up in one of my Greek helps, and it's called Vine's Dictionary of the Greek. And, uh, and Vine's defined it in this way. This word is used only of the promises of God. It often speaks for the thing promised and thus signifies a gift graciously given and not something that was secured by negotiation. Jesus said, wait for the promise. You're not going to secure this by any negotiation. You're not going to bargain for this. What you're to do is you're supposed to await the promise that God gave to you, the promise of the Holy Spirit. So God's sending of the Holy Spirit to the church was his assurance for good for those whom he loves. This particular promise that God gives to us is one that is actually repeated in the Old Testament various times. I don't want to give you all of the instances where you'll see this promise, but you'll see that as, as far back as 735 years before Christ, in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 44, verse 3, God made a promise. He said, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your seed, my blessing upon your offspring. I will pour my spirit. In 586, uh, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 27, 586 BC, he said, I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep my judgments and do them. He said, I'm going to give you a new heart, a heart of flesh, and I'll pour my spirit into you. You know, I don't know about you, but the will to do good is with me. The ability to perform that which I desire is not. So what am I going to have to help me to do that which I desire, but I'm, but I'm really unable to do? What is it that is going to help me to do that? God said, I'll pour my spirit on you. I'm going to write my word on the tablets of your heart so that the things that you do are going to be done from the inside. It's not that you're going to simply have commands on the outside like the Ten Commandments that were written on stone. I'm going to take my commandments. I'm going to write them on your heart. And so from the inside, you'll perform those things that you greatly desire but don't have the power to do. So I'll give you my commandments, but I'll also supply you with the power so that you're able to obey so all the way back in the Old Testament, God had promised to pour water upon the one who's thirsty, to pour his spirit within people. 487 B.C., Zechariah said it like this in chapter 12, verse 10, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. These are all references to his promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus repeated these promises in his ministry. He said in John 15, verse 26, when the helper comes whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. I will send this spirit and he will testify, the spirit, he will testify. In Luke 24, 49, he said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, tarry in the city of Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high. You see, he said, I will send my spirit and he'll remain with you. He'll be with you, with you and he'll be in you. In the Old Testament, you can see this various times, that the Holy Spirit would descend. But the Holy Spirit would perform his work and then he would depart. Um, when you read 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14, it very simply says, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. When you read Judges chapter 16, verse 20, um, this woman by the name of Delilah, are there any Delilahs in here? No? Okay, Delilah. I've met a few Jezebels, but I don't think I've ever met a Delilah. But Delilah called unto Samson. You remember Samson and Delilah. Delilah called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know the Lord had left him. 
And so you see that the spirit departed from Saul, the Lord left Samson. And so that gives us insight into Psalm 51, verse 11, where, where David said, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. So in the Old Testament, you would see the spirit would descend, perform his work, but would also leave. Jesus' promises that the spirit would be sent to remain and would be in them. In John 14, verse 16, he said, I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So the Holy Spirit in the New Testament sense is to be upon us, to abide with us and be in us. And so that is going to be through our lifetime. He's not going to be removed from us. And so Jesus had been speaking concerning this, remember in chapter 1, and in verses 7 and 8, he had said, you're going to be my witnesses, but to uh, succeed will require the power of the Spirit. And you're going to be witnesses of various things. You'll be a witness of my resurrection. You will be a witness that I am the Savior. And you're going to be a witness of the mission that I have sent you on. There are various ways that you're going to be a witness. But God desires to communicate to man, and he intends us to be that witness, and he's going to use us to do that. So being his witness requires power. And our lives need to evidence his presence. And for that, he sends his spirit. Empowered by him, we have the ability to endure hardship, to rejoice in the face of suffering, resist living for the gratification of our flesh. And for us, this Holy Spirit is not just a concept, and the Holy Spirit is, is not simply some, some source of power or power itself. For us, we know the Spirit is to be uh, a, a person. He's a person of the Spirit, and we have a relationship with him. Now, this promise of the giving of the Spirit is recorded here in Acts chapter 2. It was fulfilled at Pentecost. In verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And I'm going to lay a, a foundation for us because I hope to bring it to application as we conclude tonight's study. But let me lay a foundation by giving you some details, details that will help you to understand what is taking place. First, in verse 1, it says the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is one of the three great Jewish feasts along with tabernacles and Passover. The day of Pentecost is also called the Feast of First Fruits. And uh, it took place 10 days after Jesus' ascension. 50 days after his resurrection. The feast was established primarily to commemorate two things. One, it commemorates God's deliverance of the nation of Israel from Egyptian bondage. And two, it reminds the people of his faithful provision for their every need. This feast is a joyful celebration because people remembered God's goodness toward them. And so during this time, Jerusalem would be filled with pilgrims. And it's been estimated that there would be about 3 million people who are there in Jerusalem. So when it had fully arrived, the day of Pentecost, there was a great amount of people there, and they're all celebrating, but it's the day that the church is actually officially birthed. Now we're going to notice some things here, and I want to show you these things as we look at the passage. One, I want you to note with me the attitude of the 120 the 120 who are there awaiting this promise to take place. It says to us that they were there in unity. It says in verse 1, they were all with one accord in one place. So what we have here is we have an attitude of unity. They are united together anticipating the reception of the promise of the Father. And as you see this, you're going to see what takes place because we're going to be seeing the, the giving of the Holy Spirit, which fulfills the Father's promise, and then we're going to see the effect on the lives of the believers as well as what it does uh, to or how it affects the non-believers. And so there they are. They're together. We see the unity of believers, and we also see an expectation. See, here's something for you, and it's so basic, but I... I feel necessary to say it. You're not going to receive if you're not waiting and trusting to receive something. It just doesn't happen. There's people who like to pray and say, oh, yes, Lord, if it be your will. But in reality, they're not expecting anything to happen. They're just praying 
that way because they've been taught to pray like that. I remember a, a pastor who had, um, was pastoring a church in a very dry area, and there was a drought, and the drought was severe. And so the pastor had gotten up before the congregation and said to the congregation, you know, only God can provide water. We need God to provide water. Will you join me in prayer, and will you pray with me, along with me, that God will bring rain? And so the church prayed. There was a time of prayer, and people were crying out to God. And he said, oh, Lord, would you please bring rain by next Sunday? And so they got together the following Sunday. It hadn't rained. And the pastor looks at the congregation and says, uh, well, we prayed last week, week for rain, and it didn't rain, did it? And they shook their head, no. He said, but we really didn't expect it, did we? They looked at him puzzled. How would you know we didn't expect it? None of you brought your umbrellas. You know, sometimes we, sometimes we pray just because we should, right? We pray because that's what Christians do, right? That these people, this 120 who were there in an upper room, were waiting for a promise. And they knew that their God would supply that promise. They knew it. They knew it. You know, one of the things, and I'll be honest with you, in my spiritual life, the Lord has been reminding me for the last two weeks, this has been the thing that is freshest on my heart. And it's just a very basic thing, and I'll just say it this way. And it's, for me, it's personal for you, whatever it may be that the Lord is teaching you. This is what he's reminding me of right now. This is what he's been telling me almost every day in one way or another. And it's just this, I answer prayer. I answer prayer. Don't rely on yourself, rely on me. Don't rely on yourself, rely on me. He's been reminding me of how faithful he is and has been. And he's been convicting me because I find myself so very often trying to do spiritual things without spiritual power, wanting to live spiritual without the word guiding me, without the power of the spirit strengthening me. And he's been reminding me of this. He's been reminding me daily, I supply your need. I'm with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I, I need to remember those things after all these years. You, you would think, well, gosh, you've been walking with the Lord for a while. Haven't you learned that yet? You learn it in layers. You learn spiritual lessons gradually. And when you think you finally got it, he shows you something deeper. And that's how it works. And so right now he's teaching me some new things. And, and so as I read this passage, it's a simple thing. We all see it. They were all with one accord in one place. But... There was an attitude of expectation. The church was united, expecting God to move. And God is going to fulfill his promise because our God does that. So they were waiting to receive the promise. There's this unified spirit. There's anticipation. They're waiting on the Lord. They put aside their self-seeking. They're waiting for God to, to keep his promise. Now, this is a great thing because when you look at the history, especially of the 12 apostles, you know that there are many times in their, in their ministry uh, school with Jesus that they would argue amongst themselves as to who is the most important, who is the greatest and all. And there wasn't a spirit of unity so very often, but that is not true anymore. They're together now. They're united together. And God has taken the many and he's now making them one. And he's intending to do something amongst them. Again, Jesus had commanded them, to, to tarry in Jerusalem till you receive power. They're praying, and they're waiting, and they have an expectation. They're going to receive that promise. And so they have an attitude that is demonstrated and, and uh, a heart that anticipates uh, what God is going to do. And, and there are three things that contribute to the receiving that promise. And we see one is their obedience, as mentioned a moment ago. He had said, do not depart from Jerusalem, and in obedience they remained. We see a second thing in that unity. They're no longer selfishly seeking personal benefit. And then thirdly, we see their expectation. They're hungering and they're thirsting for the Lord. And as this is taking place, verse 2 says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled the whole house where they were, they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues, and 
as the Spirit gave them utterance. The promise is fulfilled. The sound of a rushing, mighty wind was heard, and it filled the house. What was this when it says they heard this? By the way, it's interesting how this is phrased. It says, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind, and it filled the whole house. What filled the whole house? The sound or the mighty wind? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> we do know this that wind in Scripture is often used as a symbol of the Spirit. And Jesus spoke about that when he was having that famous conversation with Nicodemus. When he was speaking to Nicodemus as recorded in John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, Jesus said, I, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. And then he said this, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So wind was used as a symbol of the Spirit. Interestingly enough, wind is also used as a symbol of life. In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 7, it says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being. The word breathed uh, into him, he breathed into him, and, 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 and all. It, it, it gives us the idea of, of, of wind or the breath of God. And, and so in the Bible, wind can be a picture of life, a picture of the spirit. Combined, it's the life-giving spirit. And so what you have here is you have them in anticipation awaiting the promise of the Father so that he might enter into them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, as they're there, and this is taking place, and you can imagine what that would have been like up there in that room, there appears to them, according to verse 3, divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each of them. Tongues of fire. This was a visible phenomenon illustrating what was occurring. Fire in this passage represents the Lord's presence. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, it says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. It demonstrates the Lord's presence, but it also speaks of purification. Remember Isaiah chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, where it says, One of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. The working of the Holy Spirit is a purifying work. And, it, and it, as you're purified, the Lord's presence is better experienced. And so what you have here is you have the Holy Spirit coming upon obedient, selfless, expectant individuals who are being purged. And what that produces is a holy disciple. Oh, my. Sometimes I get away from my notes. I'm going to do that for a moment. And so you say, please do. Okay, I will. <laughs> the Holy Spirit and the Holy Bible will always produce, when believed, a holy life. Just keep that in mind. The Holy Spirit and the Holy Bible when received by faith and acted upon, <coughs> produces a holy person. Holiness is spoke, it, it, it speaks of being separated to the Lord. It isn't something that you become because you try so hard. It, it isn't become because you, you can clasp your hands in front of you and bow your head with a very fake, humble look and speak softly to people. I used to think that's what it was. And I used to, when as, a, as a new Christian, I used to think that's what you're supposed to do, kind of like walk around like, like that, you know, real kind of, and talk softly and all. No, that's more Pharisaic than anything because I was trying to appear something that I really wasn't. But I discovered, and I'm discovering, that when the Word of God is active in my, in my life, when I'm reading it and with the intent to obey it, it awakens in me my inadequacy 
and inability. It encourages me so often, but sometimes it brings like a surgeon's scalpel. It, it brings a, an operation of my soul, if you will, to remove something that God is not pleased with. And I realize that when I'm reading the Bible, that there are times when I see myself, because it's a mirror, and I see myself in it, and I say, Lord, that really isn't my life. I really don't do that. I don't know how to do that. God, help me, and that's what he wants me to do. You see, when I study the Word of God, when you read the Bible, it isn't intended just to bring like a, a huge condemnation. It's supposed to be an encouragement to you so that you can say, Lord, oh, miserable person that I am, who's going to save me from this body of death? And then you say, you know what? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. who don't walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Lord, with you, I can do all things. And I want to live for you, Lord. I want to please you. And so what we need is we need to understand when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, he begins to purge us. And the Holy Spirit comes into our life, he also gives us his presence. And when the Holy Spirit is working in our life, he, he gives to us his power. And, and what we do is we yield to him and we obey him voluntarily and he produces in us a holiness. You see, again, in verse 3, the scripture says, one sat upon each of them. So God wanted to bless every one of these who were there awaiting him. He wanted to bless them equally. Here's something to always remember. There, there, there was in this room here, there was no single superstar. There was no very special disciple. They all are being blessed by God. One of the things that maybe will help all of us as believers today is if you take this attitude, and here's the attitude that I've had for a long time, and God is trying to refresh me in it because I have to remind myself of things he's taught me in the past. But once again, the question I used to ask was, why not me? And I don't mean it like, oh, you're doing that with them, why not me? And not, you know, this whiny kind of thing. I wasn't whining. I would just look and I'd say, Lord, you're using people. Why not me? Well, why can't I be used? I want to be used. You know, the Lord's eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show him that so he can find a man to show himself strong on behalf of. Do you know that in this room right now that there are people that God wants to use? You know this, don't you? God wants to use you mightily, but we're just, we're just not yielding to him. We're saying, no, it's somebody else. You know, there's that phrase, you know, um, when, when God is, is speaking to Isaiah and, and, and he asks the question, who will go for us? And, and uh, th there are people who would say, there he is, Lord, send him. But Isaiah said, there am I, Lord, send me. You know, it, it's just a matter of you saying, Lord, I love your word, and I want the power of your spirit, and I want to be purged of anything that would keep me from being used by you, and I want to be, I'm making myself available, and a lot of people won't, because they're afraid. They're afraid that he may have them do something they don't want to do. Give something up they don't want to give up. And you know what? There's nothing that he ever has you do that isn't so pleasing that you'll ask yourself once you're doing it, why did I wait so long for this? Why did I wait so long? And there's nothing so hard that he will ask you to do that he doesn't supply the power for you to do it. It's all about him and a willing heart. And what I am asking the Lord for is to purge me, to work in me. I pray that, and then this is sincere, I'm not trying to pretend in front of you anything. It's just, I do this every day, and I do it often every day. God forgive me, God work in me, God use me, because Lord, in these last days, without you, this world is hopeless. Without you, Jesus, this world is going to hell in a handbag. Lord, there is a battle going on right now, as God obviously knows. And it isn't, it isn't political at all. It's spiritual. There's a battle going on that is so spiritual right now. Truth against error. Light against darkness. And we're seeing it in the newspaper as it's being fought daily. I think it's sad. And I'm not condemning anyone. It can sound that way. It saddens my heart. It truly does that I, 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 was, uh, I was up in San Luis Obispo last, last week. You know, somebody's got to go. And uh, <laughs> I took a few days uh, with my wife to, to try and relax. I, I met with a friend of mine.
because when I go on vacations, I usually minister. That's what I do. And while I was there, I was doing that. And it's a pleasure to do that. Forgive me if it sounds like anything other than it's a pleasure to do that. But as I was speaking to my, my friend, a pastor friend of mine, he was saying, you know, the churches in his town on Christmas Day are closing down. On Christmas Day, churches are closing down. That's happening in our little city here in Chino. Christmas Day, churches are closing down. And, and I think, how, how sad is that? How sad is that? Because, you know, radical Islam doesn't take days off. They're going to learn, and they go to learn to hate every day. And Christians, well, it's more important for me to do something I want to do with my family, my friends, or whatever, than it is for me to say, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Listen, part of the reason why the United States is in such bad condition is because the church is in such bad condition. Because the church isn't walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we're more caught up with pleasing ourselves. And we don't believe in eternity very much anymore. Many don't even believe that there is such a thing as a hell. So why even be concerned about it? And if mom wants to go there, it's up to her. We don't have a concept of a holy God and a holy life. The early church? No. Jesus said, you tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. In, and in obedience and in anticipation, 120 in an upper room, we're waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. The day of Pentecost fully arrives. There's a sound of a mighty rushing wind. It fills the house. Tongues of fire begin to rest on each one. And God births the church. It comes into existence. Notice how it says in verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The word filled means to be abundantly supplied. It speaks really of the overflowing presence of God. There's a theologian by the name of Gordon Fee, and he said, the living God is a God of power, and by the Spirit, the power of the living God is present with us and for us. And what God is doing is he's birthing the church into existence, and he's giving to the people what they so desperately want and so desperately need. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us peace, and the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us joy. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us love and contentment. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us power. It's the Spirit who, who makes us victorious. It's the Holy Spirit who makes our life satisfying. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to give to us. And Jesus had said, you need to drink of the Spirit. And when you do that, God's Spirit will meet your deepest thirst and your deepest longings. That's a fact. That's a fact. You know, I, I keep saying this because I get, I get a certain uh, sentimental gratefulness every Christmas, you know, not just for Christmas Day. Of course, I'm so thankful for the celebration of the birth of Jesus. But two days later, I have an opportunity to celebrate the day that he came into my life. And, and I have to tell you, every December, right around this time, I get a refreshed and a renewed joy because I look at how faithful God has been. You know, one year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, now 46 years. My God is faithful and he has provided in every way, shape and form. And there are times when I will look at my, my wife and I'll look at my kids, I'll look at my grandkids. I, I drive into this parking lot. I, I speak to my staff and my heart wells up with joy, with gratitude, thankfulness, because I know what I was and I know what I am. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not yet what I will be, but I'm not gonna be what I used to be ever again, because what I'm now is being made into the image of Christ. And I get excited about that and I don't understand Understand why people aren't. I don't. I don't. I, I you know, I really, oh boy, here we go. I should, see, that's what I mean. 13 verses, who knows? God is good. No, God is good. God is good. God is good. 
He has been so good to me and to us, to you too, to you too. I was thinking about that today. I was thinking how sometimes people say, well, it's easy for you to say you're a pastor. You're supposed to say that. No, I've learned. I've learned how faithful he is. I've learned that he never leaves you nor forsakes you. I've learned that he supplies all you need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. I've learned that he keeps your tears in a bottle. He remembers it. I've learned the goodness of the Lord, how God is faithful, how God gives you hope, how God gives you strength, how you're never alone, how he provides in every way, shape, and form in ways that are mysterious to you at that moment because you may not see clearly what he's doing, but afterwards you do, and you say, so that's what you were doing. I didn't realize it in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the sorrow, in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of all I was going through. I didn't know you were refining me. I didn't know that. And here I am complaining, Lord, when in fact you were answering my prayer because, Lord, I had said, make me like you, and I forgot you were wounded. And I said, make me like you, and I forgot you were lonely. I said, make me like you, and I forgot you were forsaken. I said, make me like you, and I forgot you suffered on a cross. And if you went through things for me, what makes me think I won't go through things for you? And when you begin to realize that, and no, I'm not putting a high premium on suffering. No, I'm not saying let's go out, break some glass, and crawl on it with our bare knees. No. What I am saying is that the road to the cross is covered with thorns. And there are times of pain that cause you to give up on everything except him. And then you learn to hold fast to him because his word is true and because his spirit empowers you and strengthens you and transforms you. Listen, I've been asking the Lord for a long time, and I know many in this room have probably said the same thing, Lord, deepen me. And that's why I say to you, if you want deep faith, you go through deep things. And that's when you learn that the Lord sometimes whispers when the world screams. And you have to learn to hear the whisper of the Lord above the scream of the world. And the world tries to distract you, and it does. But he is a still, small voice. And you quietly wait on him. And he speaks to your heart through his word, by his spirit, through a friend who calls you up and says, how you doing? Been thinking of you. I've been praying for you. I love you. And you say, you don't know how I needed to hear that just now. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. See, we're not into just Christian philosophy. Of course, Christian philosophy does exist. Yes, there are, there are things that we believe and we hold as philosophic truths truths that are emblems of our intellectual beliefs. There's no doubt about that. But it's deeper than simply man's philosophy. What it is, it's God's revelation. And God reveals himself to us, and he does so by his word, and he does so by his spirit. And these people were waiting in obedience for the Holy Spirit to come fully upon them, and it happens. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice what happens. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Oh, tongues. What are tongues? Well, tongues uh, is a language. It's a language that's unlearned. It's a language of praise. It's a language of worship. Jesus in, in Mark 16, verse 17 said concerning believers, they shall speak with new tongues. The English word tongues is the Greek word glossa. The word glossa speaks of a language. And one Greek um, expert said it's specifically a language that is unacquired. So tongues, when you see it here in verse 4, it says they began to speak with other tongues. Tongues is a spiritual gift from God that is supernaturally received. It is an unlearned language. The language may be of human origin. We'll see that in just a moment. 
It may even be referred to in Scripture as a heavenly, uh, the tongue of angels, a heavenly dialect. The language is one of praise to God and is directed to God. It is not something that you are speaking to men. You can see that if you're interested by looking at 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 14. You'll see something more specific. I'm not going there today, but that's what it speaks about. And it speaks of them speaking in tongues, notice again in verse 4, as the Spirit gave utterance. So the Holy Spirit didn't take over their vocal cords, but he inspired their speech. Verse 11 gives us insight into what they were saying, because it says, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And so that's what they were doing. They were speaking concerning the wonderful works of God. They were praising God and giving him glory. So as this is taking place, verse 5, we'll go to verse 13. I think I can do it. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. They were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Phryg Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, Parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs, and people from Montclair and Chino. We hear them. <laughs> we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. They were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they're full of new wine. They're drunk. That's what they're saying. They're drunk. They're full of new wine. Now, they apparently spill out of the upper room, and they're magnifying God, speaking in languages they haven't learned, but praising God. And there are all these nations there, and they say, we can hear what they're saying in our own language. Verses 12 and 13 say they were amazed, they were perplexed. And they're saying, what is this? What does this mean? Though some were amazed, perplexed, Notice others began to mock. So instead of wasting time arguing with those who were mocking, Peter actually is going to speak to those who were inquisitive. We're going to look at that next time we're together. Now, obviously, these disciples were under the Spirit's influence. And as they're out there speaking, and as they're out there uh, making known the wonderful works of God, there is a response. The people will respond Normally, in, in the same way even to this day, when God is doing a work, there'll be some who mock and there'll be others who listen. I'm looking at the time because we're going to celebrate communion and I don't want to keep you too long on one thing because I really want us to celebrate communion together. So I'll kind of prepare and I'm going to go further. I mean, that's the reason I wanted to go into Acts because I wanted to share some things with you over time that really will make a difference in our life. So I'll say it like this. There are people today who are afraid of opening their hearts to the power of the Holy Spirit because they have seen some weird things done in the name of Jesus. Perhaps they've turned on the television and seen some odd things taking place. Perhaps they, they've gone to a church where weird things happened and scared them. I, I as a new believer, I, I had an interesting experience. I, I share this very often when I'm speaking on this subject, but I understand how you could, you could be confused when, when people are claiming something is the Spirit when in fact it's not. And I was a new believer, I was 20 years old and, and we went to what was called a revival, and I lived in Norwalk. We went to a small church in Long Beach. And as we went into this very small church, and I mean it's a small building, the small church building, it was an African-American church, a Pentecostal church, and they had invited um, uh, an evangelist who was 
kind of, he looked like a football player. He's real stocky, I still remember, real stocky. He had blonde hair and he wore it in a, kind of like a swooping hairstyle, like we used to call it a pompadour. And uh, yeah, and he was, he was shouting, I'm a brand new Christian. I haven't been a Christian more than two weeks. Brand new, brand new. And, and there I am at a revival, two, three weeks, and, and this guy's got a drum set at the base of the platform, and he would scream at us, and after he screamed for a few minutes, and I mean scream, he was shouting and screaming and all of that, and I'm just kind of like, you know, watching this. Uh, he would step off the platform, and he would get behind the drums, and he'd start playing the drums. I had never seen anything like that before. He was pretty good. I said, can you play Wipeout? No, as I was watching. So it was entertaining more than anything. I'm a brand new Christian, you know. I haven't been high for two, three weeks. So this was very entertaining. Then he'd get back on the platform and scream. Then he began to tell us, God wants to fill us with his spirit. And if you want all that God has to offer you, come up here. So I'm a new believer and I'm saying, I want everything God has for me. So I go up to what they call the kneeling bench to tarry. So there are several of us at this kneeling bench. And he said, you just cry out to God and, and, and beg him to fill you. He's telling us to do things the Bible doesn't say, but there I am yelling, God, fill me, God, fill me. And it's just really odd. And we were kneeling for a good 30, 40 minutes at least, tearing. And finally, nothing happens. And finally, he says, all right, it's testimony time. All of you who just were filled with the Spirit, come and tell everybody what God did. And I'm thinking, I can't do that. He didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. And I can't lie. I'm in church. But he has me in line. I still remember I'm awkwardly standing in line, walking this way, and I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> and then people are kind of, oh, heaven was opened up, and angels and birds, and, you know, and I'm just going. I'm thinking I'm going to just bum them all out because I still remember, God, what should I say? What should I say? I don't want to lie. I don't want to lie. So I got behind, I still remember, I still remember walking up and standing just like this. The first time I ever was in public speaking behind a, a pulpit. And I'm looking at this crowd of people and they're looking back at me. And I said this, I still remember what I said. I said, I really can't put into words <laughs> what I just went through, which is 100% true. But the funny thing about it is the people out there in the audience kind of nodded their head at me. It's like, yeah, nothing happened to us either. It was one of those moments, you know. God wants to pour his spirit on us. He gives his Holy Spirit to those who obey him, the Bible tells us in Acts 5.32. Jesus said, uh, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? It's not a matter of us begging God. It's not a matter of us trying to make ourselves better. It's a matter of us saying, Lord, I want to obey you. I need your help. Will you fill me with your spirit? And Jesus said he will. We need the power of the Spirit of God today. I grieve for this moment because we are, as, as a people in the United States and as churches in the United States, by and large, the ones that are getting much attention are the ones that are really grieving the Spirit rather than walking in the Spirit. Because what is happening is we are today, instead of saying, I want to be holy, what we're saying is, we pastors are saying, I want to be popular. Instead of saying, I want to be inspiring, we're saying, I want to be imitated. And in, instead of saying, I want it all to be for Jesus so that they may know his name, so many are saying, I want to be known by my name. And what's happening is 
holiness is leaving our personal life and uh, the flesh is replacing it. When you have discussions with people, when they're saying to you that they feel free to do whatever sinful thing they want to do because they're still going to heaven because of the grace of God, that tells me they're not in the word of God. Because again, the Holy Word and the Holy Spirit, when received, produce a holy life, a transformed life. And no, it isn't some put on life where you're walking around like, oh, I'm so holy. It's that, no, God is just moving in you. And then people begin to say, what's going on in you? What happened to you? Something's changed in you. And you say, you know, to be honest with you, it's all the Lord. He's just changed my life. I just, want to, I just want to serve him. I just want to follow him. I just want to be like him. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit. So these 120 were commanded by Jesus, tarry, into Jerusalem, tarry in Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high, in obedience and unity and a prayerful anticipation. The day of Pentecost fully arrived. They were baptized in the Spirit. The church was birthed. The first thing they do is pour out of that upper room. They begin to magnify God. Unbelievers here, they say, these people don't know our language. They're unlearned languages, but we can understand what's taking place. They're magnifying God. Then others are saying, oh, they're just filled with new wine because their behavior is so different. And so in the midst of all of this spiritual experience, the apostle Peter does what needs to be done. He gives a scriptural explanation. Any spiritual experience needs a scriptural explanation. We'll see that next time we get together.